right, well, we'll roll too because it's a cold rafter and it's time to go. How you doing? That's the first question I tell you not to ask. No, hello, how are you? I'm Lauren Passarelli. I'm from the guitar department and um, I wanted to talk today about creativity and technology because it's uh, so interesting. I'm finding every year, the last probably 20 years, <laughs> I've been saying, oh my God, this is like the best year to be a musician. It is just so cool with the equipment they've got going on. And that's because if you have a little background on me, I mean, I started playing guitar and writing songs very, very young, nine, ten years old, and I knew from a very young age that I was writing way too many songs to pay for studio time, you know, at a recording studio, that I really loved the idea of being able to hear all the ideas in my head at the same time, and that I needed some kind of a dream machine so that I could hear my music all together. And I started off at uh, about 11, with, um, we, we have a, a different kind of mid-range problem happening now. <laughs> I almost feel like it could feed back at around that. But uh, it's not, so I guess that's good. Um, I started recording with two uh, cassette decks. And half of you probably don't even know what those are. There's those, those, <laughs> 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 those little, little boxy things, those little rectangles that had like little, eighth inch tape in them. I had two machines and I would record to one, play it back, play with it, record to the next one, back and forth about 14 times. It was noisy as anything, but it was amazing fun to be able to hear all the ideas and sing different parts and all that kind of thing. And then of course that progressed to all kinds of analog options, which was mostly reel-to-reels for me. Four tracks and uh, eight tracks and then digital tape. And then just two years ago, I jumped right into the digital thing quite nervously uh, right into logic. And, um, you know, to have all the analog gear I've ever had in my studio, to have all those available effects and all those things that you guys know about now. And the fact that even when I was a student, we never heard our four horn charts played well. You know, there was always some kind of a project band, but they, they couldn't play it well. <laughs> They always said they could, but you know. <laughs> and then we, I, to this day, I haven't even heard the, the string quartet I wrote for scoring for strings. I mean, like, I can't wait to get in there with reason now and, and mess around and see what that sounded like. The teacher would just read the score and say, yeah, very nice. And we'd go, oh, oh, oh. I'm, good. I'm glad I got an A, but I have no. I would do it with four guitars and stuff, you know. But I never heard the real timbres, and so I just think it's fantastic. So the instruments I've been talking about in the first uh, clinic of this was, um, the Godon three-voice guitar, and now a few people are, a few manufacturers are imitating that. And what that does is um, give you an electric guitar, an acoustic guitar, and a MIDI signal. A MIDI guitar gives you a pin type of output to a box, which translates it into a MIDI signal, and then gives it to your digital uh, recorder or your interface or your uh, mixer. And now, you know, they're making USB guitars. They just, they're just triggers, they're, they're controllers. And any instrument that you play that you feel very well versatile, uh, you know, versed in, you can find a, a MIDI controller for it so that you can play the other sounds. Now, I love working with real musicians and I love working with uh, real keyboard players especially, but I brought a bunch of fake keyboard things today because um, when I work with other players, I want to be able to let them do their thing and give me the best of their musicianship, you know. And sometimes they come up with something really gorgeous for one of my songs. Then there are other times where I hear a part that I want played a very particular way. You get used to the articulation and the way you want it phrased. And if you write it down, then you have to take that time either to really write down the notation of it, of the articulation even, or you've got to hope that they've got an ear that when you sing it to them or play them the fake thing, they can improve on it rather than playing it completely different. So sometimes it's just a little faster for me. Uh, as embarrassed as I am to be playing what we're about to play with this amazing piano player that just came in. <laughs> um, <clears throat> when it's in the mix and you don't hear it sounding like bad piano playing, because I play guitar, bass, and drums, but I don't play piano. And I can find little guide tones and things like that, but most of the time I find things that are just too hard for me to play. And it takes me so long to learn them, and then as soon as I take my hand off, I forget where they are, and <laughs> it's so much easier to trigger a guitar and to uh, trigger a Fender Rhodes or an organ or just get a pad happening and things like that. So let's see. On the CD that I get, 
over there. I gave you. If we go in order, let me talk about something else first. We'll go in order. There's two Line 6 guitars that I have. This is the electric one, and I'll tell you about that in a little while. I also have the acoustic one. And last time I did the first part of this clinic, I brought all three, but it's a lot to schlep around. It uh, looks like a little hollow body, semi-acoustic acoustic. And it's got all these different model sounding acoustics in it, which is really nice. But it also has the place where you can store different tunings. And so does this. And that's the coolest thing about live performance we'll get to with that. The Line 6 acoustic just doesn't have the resonance, though. When you play it unplugged, it actually sounds like a nice guitar. And it feels very nice to play. But as soon as you plug it in, everything kind of goes dun, dun. There's like no sustain. So it's kind of strange. And one day I picked it up just to say, well, you know, you should find something you can do with this thing. <laughs> because when I play it, I feel like it doesn't respond to me the way I want it to, so it's kind of hard to perform with it. But I started playing something, and I was in another tuning. I don't even remember what tuning I was in, but all these low notes were coming out, and I thought it sounded really cool. And a friend of mine lives by the ocean. <laughs> I hadn't heard from her in a long time. I said, it's a low tide, because I went, ooh, low notes, it's a low. And I started singing these silly things, and I came up with this idea for this song. And What's interesting about playing with the Line 6 guitars when you're triggering the alternate tunings is that you hear the guitar in standard tuning. This isn't the Gibson robot thing that tunes the strings and changes them all around so that all of a sudden they're in that tuning, literally. This is doing it <coughs> all with algorithms and you know just digital signals. Keeps the strings in standard tuning and just tells them, go down a half step. Or this one go up, this one go down, this one do this, this one do that. And, um, both of them can save them in the banks, in the extra custom banks on the guitar. So if you play the first example, you'll hear the very low guitar idea. And then when the second string instrument comes in, it's a sound on that acoustic guitar called a mandola. And uh, I played that in standard tuning and put them together because I was hearing the acoustic strings with the low triggered strings. And together they sounded really cool. <laughs> sound I had that was giving me the idea to want to write the tune. tracks that I mixed. Yeah, keep it playing. Yeah. So this is a song called Low Tide. <laughs> 